Um, so any woman who's in a transition in life can benefit from these skill sets of coming back to your true self, making time to establish that authenticity on the inside, because that, that will shine on the outside and you'll start to attract things that align with you and repel the things that don't. And then all of a sudden you open your eyes one day and you look around in gratitude and you're like, wow, my life is really fucking great. Mm -hmm. Instead of being worried about all the things that aren't happening for you that you want, worried about the kids running around all crazy, you know, like whatever it is in your life, it doesn't matter what's, if that stuff is going on or not, it could still be happening. And you could wake up and be like, wow, my life is really fucking great. Good to be here, Jason. Yeah. Now we're going to start. <laughs> well, I am sorry for uh, hacking up that thing, but I, I totally believe in leaving the uh, imperfections in there because it shows that it's real, right? Yeah, um, me too. Integrated. I don't know why. I, I study integrated s- stuff all the time. Why that? I've seen that word a million times, and for whatever reason, I just read it off there. tripped me up, but it happens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for being here. Uh, hey, hey, guys, I, you know, I want to tell you something about Thalia that... Uh, She's not going to brag about herself about, and I'm going to go ahead and do it right okay. out of the gate. Um, this young lady has a, a very, very fierce energy about her. And um, I, for one, just can't wait to see what happens when she actually lets it go and truly believes it the same as what um, I think people when come in contact with her feel. Um, and so it's going to be really cool. And so with that being said, I'm totally going to hit you right out of the gate with a tough question. Um, so we're defining on the Beyond Hope project, hope is a couple of things. One, hope is the ignition of a starting point. So it's the place to start. And you're ultimately going to go, and then eventually you're going to fail, just like everything in life. And how we're also defining hope is that it's a way back to that path. So it's a start, then you go figure out your stuff, and then you're going to fail, and you're going to come back to it through hope. And this is what we would like to start sparking with people with this project and all of that stuff. So my question to you is that if you can go back in your life at any point in time, at any age, what would be a starting point? Or you can pick a way back to that path that you would give yourself, and what would it be? What's the hope that I would give myself? Sure. And when? There's like so many pivotal moments that I can think of. And you know, it's funny, I always like to think about, you know that Disney movie Inside Out, and you've got like these little core memories Um, so I have, all of us have these, these core memories that help shape us, whether they are good memories or not so great memories, traumatic experiences. And I think the one thing that I would do is go visit my teenage self because she was so angry and just Mm. didn't think she was helpless. Right. Cause it's all behind, it's all this stuff is running behind the scenes, all of the limiting beliefs, the doubts, all that stuff runs behind the scenes. And then what you see are the projections of the people trying to protect themselves. So what that manifested is for me is I was just an angry kid. So I took it out on sports, on my dad, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the poor guy, he, him and I got in a fight every morning over, over my clothes, what I was going to wear to school that day. And probably subconsciously, I was trying to wear the clothes that would piss him off the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) So And then just feeling disconnected from everybody. Like nobody gets me, nobody understands me. Um, So I would go back to that version and I would remind her that she already has everything she needs if she chooses to look at it again. Mm -hmm. So part of my coming home experience, you talked about that hope process coming back. And it made me smile so big because I'm 30 now and I feel like the last three years of my life have been that coming home experience, have been shedding the layers of what I built up to protect myself, to feel like the smartest person in the room, to feel like the most athletic person in the room, trying to get this perfect body to be like, you know, I just wanted everyone to love me because the truth was I didn't love myself. Mm. And so these last three years, I've really worked on that self-love. And so if I could just go back and tell her, to just go have some fucking fun mm-hmm. <laughs> and remember that it, it doesn't matter how many people it repels. You don't want those people in your life anyway. Right. Um, so yeah. That's good. That's really good. So what, 
what do you think I like, caused like in, in that hating yourself, what would be like the root of the cause of that? Is it, is it that you had this idea in your head that of what perfection was, and that's what you were struggling with? Was it something that you felt pressure from outside people? Like, where was that coming from in at 30? You have to forgive me for a minute. Like, did you grow up with social media or you're, are you still a little where you didn't have that yet? I'm, I don't, I'm trying to think in my head as you're saying that, like what age were you completely always connected to the internet? Um, but I would think 30, you're pretty darn close to, it was. We're like the, the, fr- cause I'm still a nineties baby. So right. we were around, it's born in 93. So we still had some of that time period of just like no tech. Yeah. Got my first cell phone at, 13, I think. Okay. But it was still like the, you know, you're texting with the buttons. Yeah. And um, there was no Instagram or Facebook. Like, I got Facebook, I think, my senior year of high school. Okay. So, like, it was still, I'm a little bit of both. I think that's what's cool about the millennials. We still remember DVD players and VHS tapes. (laughs) So, um, but yeah, I I would say I, it's not like a tech thing because I know that that's a problem with the current generation. Is sure. so my youngest sister, um, she just started college. She's a sophomore in college now, but she is one of those who grew up with all of that, just constantly bombarding right. her. So she grew up from a really young age to know all the problems in the world, um, which has made them incredibly empathetic generation. Um, but yeah, for me, so that really wasn't a big part of it in those teenage years. Right. However, the perfectionism came from, I think, gosh, just where it all comes from, right? We all just want to be loved. Right. And unfortunately in my household, there came some standards of what it meant to be loved, like some conditional things for love. And I want to make it clear that I don't blame my parents for any of this. I think I did when I was younger. Part of my healing process has recognized that they both came from traumatic backgrounds and they did the best they could with the knowledge that they had. Mm. And so part of my healing has been to like forgive and understand that I'm also going to mess up as a parent. And I hope that my kids will also give me that same forgiveness that I have given them because what it was, was military household. So some strict rules in place hierarchical, if that's a word, right? Like you do what I say. There was no room for me to really be an individual. Um, There's this really silly pain point, but I think it illustrates it perfectly about how I was not really feeling comfortable enough to be myself was I always wanted to take piano lessons and I just never had the courage to ask my parents to get them for me Mm. because they praised me for sports and I was good at sports. So I was like, well, they love me if I play sports, so I'm just going to do that. But I'm just going to like leave the singing and leave the dancing behind because I'm probably not even that good at it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always want a piano lesson. So we had a keyboard and I would just sit there and fiddle with it almost like every Saturday morning. So this was this unrealized dream of mine from a really early age. And I just was like, gosh, this is just so sad that I never let myself ask Right. So it's like they weren't holding me back from this dream I was. Mm. And so that radical self responsibility for our own pain points is so important in the healing journey and something that I try to challenge women to go through when they are working with me or patients in the physical therapy clinic. Same thing is radical self responsibility, even when it seems like it's somebody else's fault. Right. Right. So that's a silly example. Um, there's definitely more <laughs> dramatic things I could talk about. But um, yeah, so at 30 years old, I am learning piano. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> well, good, good for you. I think, you know, it's it's funny that you kind of poke fun of that your, your idea of being silly, because I think that what it is, is that each one of us has a different, like what is traumatic to me may not be to you. And you might say like, oh my God, that was like nothing. Wait to hear my story. And I think what is really empowering of in talking with you a lot of times that, that we've talked is that you are very aware of what you don't want to be. And I think what you're uncovering and tell me if I'm wrong and what you're really starting to kind of step into is understanding of what you do want to be and how that version tell me in your own words, is it is equally as scary as discovering yourself and everything that was that came along with the baggage of a younger you versus now 30 year old and realizing you're discovering yourself again 
and you're what does that feel like to you is it similar like if somebody's going through this process right now like you know another 30 year old is trying to figure out like damn to realize i totally have not liked myself for a long time like what, what would you say it feels like in that world it's an unshedding right it's like you have to rec- first like recognize all of the the things that you're pretending the barriers that you've built and because you're the self, the you, it's there all along. It's not something that needs to be discovered. Um, it's always there. And so that I think that is something I'm still learning too, right? Is part of this process for me has been like, okay, I want self-actualization. I want to transcend the ego, you know, like all these big spiritual words that come with, with this space. And so I'm out there like searching for the answers, reading all the books taking all these courses, trying to listen to all these gurus. And what I'm learning actually is that everybody has their own individual process and there's no right answer, which is really hard for my brain to wrap around. So what I want to, what I want people to know is that doesn't matter what you're reading or not reading. doesn't matter what the person next to you is doing. All you have to do is simply recognize when you're not in self energy and then shed it. Because once you release it, your true self will shine through. So it's not actually something you even have to find. And if there is one thing you could chase, and I put chase in quotations if you're just listening to this because it's not even a chase, it's follow the joy. Mm. And as long as you are following that deep joy, which is different than short-term pleasure, Mm -hmm. because that can get us in trouble sometimes, but this following your joy will only lead you down a path that is good, that is whole, and that leads you to your worthiness. Right. That's awesome. It's great stuff. And so if you could um, have little Thalia sit next to you right now and tell her what you're doing right now, how do you think that that angry kid would react to the stories you tell about what you're doing now and what your ambitions are going forward? She would break down in tears and feel so held and so seen. Mm -hmm. And I actually spend a lot of time with my younger versions of myself. It's part of my own healing process is to do exactly what you prompt is like spend time with these versions. And I know you and I have talked off camera a bit about an exercise that really helped you. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you want to share that with your audience or or keep it with yourself, whatever you want to do. But I did that exercise and broke down in tears. I actually shared it with my husband and he broke down in tears. And it's just this really beautiful, when we let our young selves know that they're loved, all the protective mechanisms start to melt away and they don't feel so scared of the world anymore. And what was, what was some tools in that process that you, that you maybe discovered that seemed like you were looking for all the answers outside of you, like you talked about? the gurus and the different things like this. Cause I think that's a, that's a thing that we all go through. I definitely know in my thirties for sure. It was like, somebody else has to have the answers. and It's not coming from me. Like, cause I don't even know, you know, how to even begin to like myself or whatever, but you know, is there anything in that process of, of, of in a sort, in a sense, almost forgiving as little you, the older you like that you're now evolved from what they are. And, Was there anything that you kind of gleaned out of that exercise that you apply to every day now or any sort of thing that you would recommend to other people that you can really take out of that? Mm. I think the first thing to take out of that that I would love for everyone to do is is to spend time with themselves, Mm. first and foremost, in some capacity, whether you're a meditator or a journaler or both. Um, Or you can talk to somebody who can help reflect that back to you without putting their spin on things. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is that simple of just spending time with yourself to learn who you are, what your triggers are, what you love, what you don't. So it can be as simple as that. Yeah. Do you think, do you think that your, your work is in physical therapy and rebuilding, right? How much has that played a role in this new process of uncovering this new part of you emerging is it do you are you uh, taking anything from that process of oh i gotta start 
you know, my kid's got a busted ankle right now. He's like had to start stretching and he had to do all these different things. And now he's like, oh my God, this is so much better. And you feel like a new person. Have you adopted any of that stuff along the way um, that you could use in your personal development world and your coaching and all of those, those things as well? Yeah. The body is the gateway to the soul. Mm-hmm. Like we are these beautiful whole light beings that live in these meat suits, these mm-hmm. physical bodies. <laughs> and the body is the easiest thing to start with. That is the gateway. So like, think about people who belong to gyms and exercise and all that stuff. Like, so yeah, in, in short, I take what I've physical therapy is what opened the door for me to get into the spiritual work and into the coaching because what I was recognizing is, okay, I I feel like I've got this down, this physical part, and I know how to get people better physically. What I was missing though was it was really difficult sometimes for people to love exercise, to make the time for it, to want to even take care of their bodies. Some people just didn't want to take care of themselves. They were so far down the rabbit hole and I didn't have a tool set for that. And so that's what led me into the coaching space is because I was like, I need to help teach people how to want to do these things and not just be the expert in the corner saying like, do your exercises. And then when they go, I didn't do them, then just be like, well, shame on you. You know, like that's just perpetuating more shame and blame. And I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, So that was the one thing that led me into the coaching space. And in terms of how I use the physical now within, gosh, it is such a great way to get out of your head. Um, For me personally, I used yoga as my gateway into spirituality because it helped calm the anxious thoughts down because I had to be so focused on the way that my body was moving. My breath started to sync up and it became very meditative to just move and be, be, just be. Um, and then that started to open my heart, open my mind. And then the loops stopped and that became very addictive for me. I was like, I love this feeling. I'm going to do more of it, (laughs) which led me to my teacher training, which led me to learn more about all the different spiritual teachings that are outside of just Christianity because I grew up Christian. So I'm very familiar with the Bible, the story of Jesus Christ, but I wasn't familiar with some of these other doctrines that are out there that also teach about what it means to be a good human and what it means to be in touch with your soul and your spirit. Um, so yeah, I, I use yoga in particular, a lot of meditation and Reiki skills, which is just another, it's like a Japanese light touch type of therapy Mm -hmm. to also help people do that same thing, get out of their heads and get into their bodies. That's awesome. Yeah, and I think it's really um, it's really worth noting that, like you know, at a young age to have that kind of awareness. If I could go back and be thirty and know that stuff, would have saved me lots of time. Um, so I think that you know you should celebrate the fact that you kind of have figured out, you know, your purpose, so to speak. Right now, it's going to take different shapes, right? But you you understand and and you figured out what works for you. Um, just out of curiosity, like, are you, are you trying to, in your practice, are you wanting to work with like women your age? Because I think that age is where sometimes you got your shit figured out. And sometimes it's like, <laughs> what the hell, you know? Um, but at the same time, it's where families, people are starting families and all that stuff like that. Is what, like, what range are you trying to, and I'm asking that because I want to, I have a second question kind of bu- built in here, but if you could just answer that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to answer your question. And then I yeah. want to comment on something else you said yeah. that I think deserves another little, some okay, time with. Cool. Um, it's, if you, if there's anything about like where I'm at in my process now, that like coming home journey, um, that awakening process, it's just a life transition, mm-hmm. right? It was where I was going from, um, you know, college age because I was just getting into my first job. And then all of a sudden I was like, I achieved everything I set out to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like from the time you're in school and they tell you to go to college and then get a job. And I was like, okay, I did that. Okay, now what? (laughs) So that's, you know, that's what sparked those questions about who am I? What do I want out of life? Okay, I've got a little bit of money now. What do I want to spend it on? Um, So 
any woman who's in a transition in life can benefit from these skill sets of coming back to your true self, making time to establish that authenticity on the inside, because that, that will shine on the outside and you'll start to attract things that align with you and repel the things that don't. And then all of a sudden you open your eyes one day and you look around in gratitude and you're like, wow, my life is really fucking great. Mm -hmm. Instead of being worried about all the things that aren't happening for you that you want, worried about the kids running around all crazy, you know, like whatever it is in your life, it doesn't matter what's, if that stuff is going on or not, it could still be happening and you could wake up and be like, wow, my life is really fucking great. Yeah. It's a simple attitude shift that has to happen each time you go into a new phase. So like being married, I had to go through all this process all over again about what does it mean to be married? Mm. Um, when you have a kid, you go through that process. When you have a second kid, you know, so it's like that phase of evolution. Yeah. Uh, but what you were saying about gosh, if I just knew this stuff when I was 30, yeah. I'd be so much further ahead than I am now. You'd be so, everybody I talk to who's older than me that I have these conversations with says that to me. Mm -hmm. And what I've started to realize is that's the point of human evolution mm -hmm. is that in our, in our DNA, we want our the next generation to be better than we were. That's just programmed within us. Mm -hmm. Survival of the fittest sort of deal. But I think on an even grander scale, scale on this, earthly plane as we're evolving into this next evolution of humanity of a whole new species of human without getting too like meta. Yeah, no, good, good <laughs> it part. is though that that is exactly what should be happening is that consciousness comes at a younger and younger age because we don't have to live in our survival brains anymore mm -hmm. because we are civilized for the most part. There's a lot of people who are still suffering. Um, however, yeah, I'm really excited to see even like what my youngest sister's generation is going to do. What are what are the what is that generation going to do? That's going to be really cool because they're already further ahead than I was at that age too. And I'm really excited to enter into the space of motherhood because that will also be another opportunity to elevate the human, elevate the consciousness of humanity through the next generation, so mm -hmm. that ultimately we can have less pain, less shame, less guilt, less worry, and less war in this yeah. world that's cool but you did a great job of circling it right back to what i was why i was asking the question <laughs> because um it, it's interesting because you know um what i what i would find is that some uh women that are my age um a lot of times have devoted because i'm i'm 47 so it's the still a lot of women took that role of stay-at-home mom right and what happens then is they're kid goes off to college and then it's a I don't know who I am and I think that what I want to recognize in you is that you have that ability and that power to help steer people back to that point and that's that's when I tell you that you're a fierce individual that has that energy it is that I see that in you that you have you know um, a heart-based leadership that shows and, and the way that you're going about it, I think is really cool. And I just, I, I, I don't know, I'm just fascinated by the idea of like the physical part being the way through. And do you find that there's more power in, if I'm somebody that is either 30 or 60 and I'm trying, I'm, I'm a woman and I'm trying to figure out like, man, who in the hell am I? And this, this girl's got something. I want to tap into like this sort of thing, whether it's physical or meditation or it's journaling or whatever it is, what would you recommend them to be a starting point? And what would you recommend them as they start and they're ultimately going to fail how to continue past that? Yeah. Oh, that is such a hard question because it's different for everybody. We ask hard questions. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can say, I feel like the first step is to listen to the ping, listen to the intuitive hit, that little whisper that says, mm, I'm interested in this. Even if you don't know why, follow it. Mm. See where, see where it leads you. And every time you get one of those, follow it. That's the first step. So it's not even about like, oh, it has to be this specific modality. It, it goes back to what's in your heart. Mm. Is So follow that. And that will lead you down the path. And then if it's not right anymore, 
you'll know when it's time to leave it. And if you don't know when it's time to leave and move on, the universe will quickly show you. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe in a way that you don't necessarily like. Right. Um, so that's the first step. And I would say for continuing, community is huge. Mm. The amount, amount of times I felt so lonely in my transitions, transitioning into entrepreneurship. I'm a person who never thought in a million years I would want to own a business. And then it just got birthed out of me because I saw a problem in the traditional medical system that I wanted to solve outside of the medical system. And I said, well, if there's nobody out there doing it this way, I have to figure out a way to do it myself. Um, and that feels sometimes really lonely because it's my, it's, it's your own path. Mm -hmm. So I totally get it that everybody at some point in their life is going to feel incredibly lonely mm -hmm. because our journeys are a lonely one. However, they don't have to be an isolated one. Mm -hmm. So we can all be on our individual journeys up the mountain to our peak, whether that's, you know, your, your highest self, the self-actualization that everybody wants to chase, including myself, mm. <laughs> or it's, you know, whatever it is that you want out of life and you're on that journey up the mountain, you can still look around you and be like, hey, I see you struggling. Right. Let me hold your hand. We can go up this together, right. even though we're on two separate paths. So finding a community is huge. Yeah. I think it's I think it's really great. And I know we've talked about this before, this, this idea that there's multiple versions of ourselves. And I think um, for me, you know, just kind of echoing back a little of your thoughts there was, is it was amazing on that climb up that mountain for myself, how many versions of myself I found along the way at different ages, you know, where I was like, oh yeah, 15 year old me was here. God, I made it pretty far. Like, and, and, and it is that, um, I think it ties back into awareness, right? Would you think like awareness? And, and so when somebody starts that path of awareness, you, you describe it as a ping. Mm -hmm. For me, it's audible. It's a hundred percent a voice. Um, but you know, it, it's interesting because I think a lot of times, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, do you think everybody has that, and they choose to ignore it, or do you think that it's for just a select amount of people? Everybody has it. Yeah. Easy answer. Yeah. I asked that question a lot when I started this journey of like, especially people who like seemed like they could connect and like channel other beings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, how do you do that? Right. Um, and the truth is we all can tap into our intuition, into spirit, into source. And the reason is, is because we are all born from it. So whether, whatever you want to call it, source, God, spirit, Jesus Christ, energy, whatever it is, love. That's what I like to say now. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's just conscious love. Mm -hmm. We're all born from it. And so we're, that's why we can all feel each other. And that's why we can all feel source. Now, what gets in the way is that if you look at us like we're these little beings holding a light bulb and we're this beautiful light and our DNA is actually programmed and designed to attract light to it, which is kind of cool. Um, so if you picture us just walking around with these, these little lights, as soon as we're, we're born, we are just absorbing Right. So we are born these beautiful, whole, worthy people. And from the ages of zero to seven, we, we really, that, that's what really gets imprinted on our subconscious. Um, so, and during that time, people are just throwing muck on you mm -hmm. and they're just throwing it at your light. And then your light is just all dimmed and muddy. And maybe you don't even know that there's a light there to you. It just looks like this big mud stick. And you're like, I don't even know why I'm carrying this, but I'm going to, cause it's all I know. And it isn't until somebody or something or some whatever it is just like boop, like chips away one little piece of that mud and then a little bit of brightness starts to shine. You're like, well, what's that? Right. And then you just start to keep picking at it and keep picking at it. That's the shedding process. You shed all that mud off of you. And then all of a sudden you're just this beautiful light being that you always were. Mm -hmm. And you just had to realize it. So it does take a catalyst. And for some people, it's listening to this podcast. Some people, it's going to be, they listen to it the 50th time, you know? So it's not always that first thing. That's what used to make me mad as a healthcare provider. As somebody wanted to help, it's like, gosh, I'm telling you these things. Why don't you get it? And what I realized is, oh, 
I, I'm not the one that gets to control when somebody gets something. Mm. However, it doesn't mean it's not valuable because somebody might need to hear it so many times before that chip just starts to fall off. Yeah. So what I try to do, and I'm not perfect either, is just really continue to talk and spread the message and just be myself in that way. Because I know even if somebody doesn't really f- seem like they're listening, it might help them down the road. They might come back and be like, oh, I remember she said that yeah. five years ago. <laughs> yeah. And now I want to take action on it. Yeah. I, that that's beautiful. Like really, I mean, I love I love the analogy of carrying the light and, and chipping away. And I think that um, that's what ultimately makes you a good coach is that that you've learned the patience, you know. Of and I think that's where a lot of, uh, in my opinion, where going through the physical therapy part of being a doctor is you've learned by dealing with people that don't want to listen or people that. You're just, okay, I just got to keep showing up and keep doing what I do and all this stuff like that. And I think it's taught you that patience as coaching. And I would just love to, you know, as we kind of start to wrap up a little bit here, I wanted to, I want to hear a little bit about your coaching. Tell me, like, if I'm somebody listening to this right now, how do I, like, what is it you're going to teach me? Like, how, how can I find you? How, you know, tell me, tell me more, you know, cause it's, it's like, wow, that story of the, the light, like I want, I want my mud chipped off my light, you know, like. <laughs> Uh, what, what can you tell us about that? Um, so easy to find me. Um, I'm on Instagram. You can DM me or sign up for a free call where we just get to dive in together. Um, so that's the easiest way to find me. Now the process itself, that's why I love coaching so much is that I've been the expert in a space where it created a power dynamic. That's physical therapy, right? Where, and it's it's important sometimes, right? Like you want your heart surgeon to be the one calling the, the shots. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to yeah. be like telling your heart surgeon what to do. Um, in a coaching space, it's very much more collaborative. So I'm not there to tell you what to do. I'm there to be a mirror and help you reflect the things that you just can't seem to quite articulate or make sense of on your own. And you need someone to hold that space for you. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there is some consulting involved in terms of when people want to learn more, then I'll teach them more, at least to the best of my ability of what I know. For instance, a big one that helps me that I like to share with people is the levels of consciousness that are um, presented by the work of David R. Hawkins because he makes it very scientific. And for my science-trained brain, it was really nice to have some scientific backing for the world, the word world of spirituality, in that we all radiate and vibrate these certain frequencies, and there's levels to them. And we always operate at a base level. Um, Most of us are on like the fear, the shame, whatever sort of levels. And then you hit, and those are all like negative, not negative as in bad, but negative as in like a negative type of vibration. Mm. Once we hit the level of courage, you shift into positive. So it takes courage to take that leap up into the positive vibrational states. Um, So yeah, diving into his work is a great place to start. And I teach that in the programs too, sometimes depending on who I'm working with. So um, yeah, that's the process to look forward to. It's very self-led, right? So it can look very different per individual. Yeah. Like I've got one person that I'm working with right now. She wasn't really vibing with working across the screen because she just needed someone to have their hands on her. So she comes in and I Reiki her the whole time and we just talk and stuff comes out and there's tears and then there's insights and I'm just holding the space. Right. Um, and it's really refreshing to not have to feel like an expert yeah. all the time. Yeah, I would. I, I will. Um, I will back that up with a little extra. Um, the the cool part about that, you guys, is that when you're when you're in presence with her, what you really do realize is that she is present with you. Um, she does a great job of making you understand that in the moment you're the important part, and. What's beautiful about that, though, is that she also is really aware of who she is and that can bring that knowledge to that present moment for you. So if you're somebody that is struggling with trying to figure out where do I begin, you know, it's awesome. It's awesome. I'm telling you, like, it would have saved me a lot of time if I would have had a coach that would have been able to kind of help me in that scenario uh, because I was kind of a little bit, like, lost in the woods. Um, and But it was finding 
you know, that voice inside of myself. I didn't have the bravery to seek out somebody else, right? And probably out of shame, I lived on that that spiral, right? And I think that, you know, um, but I just really wanted to echo everything that she just said is, is um, you know, maybe 30 on a date, but not by who she is. She's very wise, um, she's a very uh, loving person. Um, I've gotten to spend some time with her and just really get to know her and and uh, a genuine person that um, if you're really looking to change your life and really looking to start a spark of hope and figure out your path, um, she is a great place to start. And uh, you know, I appreciate you coming in here and uh, spending time with me and uh let me ask these questions and being patient with me as I screwed up the word integrated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, guys, there, there's a huge thing that we we need from both of you, from everybody listening. Uh, we both need it. Is the message of hope gets out there by you sharing and letting everybody know it exists. Um, so I know that you heard something in here that either yourself or someone else you know, or you know 10 other people in your group that needs to hear this. Maybe it's that you know 10 other people that need Thalia's help in coaching world. Um, how you help is that in this description, you're going to find Thalia's Instagram. Um, you're going to find the links to this podcast. You need to share these. Let other people know that people out there are doing this great stuff. This is not a guru way of solving things. It's a way of helping you figure out what works best for you. And this is what is Thalia's strong suit. And I really encourage you to look out for her stuff. Follow her. She's doing great stuff. She does amazing stuff. Yoga. It's like I'm watching her videos. I'm like, oh my God, like if I try to do that, like I'd be like, you know, crunched in half or something. But uh, <laughs> And super strong. I mean, I see her like doing some Olympic lifting. It's like, wow. Yeah, it's you go, unexpected. girl. <laughs> People, I, my husband was just telling me a client of his found my Instagram and said the same thing about yeah. like, you think it's going to be this typical yoga page, and then boom, she's boom. just pushing yeah. weight she's like over her head. Like huge my weight. Like, All right, right on. That's awesome. Uh, but uh, but guys, please uh, help us sh- uh, spread this hope. Uh, follow Thalia and. Um, by all means, if you find people like her in your life, it, it's important to invite them into your world um, because they will indeed change your life. And uh, again, just uh, you guys are doing a great job being human. I know it's tough sometimes and you know, life will hand you things. And it's our job to understand that there are people out there that are beacons to help. And uh, Dahlia is one of those people. And uh, just thank you so much for coming in. And uh, I know I echo what you want to say is uh, we hope that somebody took something out of this and it helps. Yeah, shine your light, baby. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Foxland Media. Think big.